you can't really talk at this era about Peter without Spike because it was a wonderful luck combination that Spike was this extraordinary, prolific and an amazing inventive writer. Up till then, you know, it had all been like, you know, high class, jolly fun, the Western Brothers, nothing wrong with them, but that was the, oh, it had to be, you know, like the Frank Randall, you know, fat men with uh, funny sticks of Blackpool rock. And Spike came along and, as it were, wiped the board with it, got rid of it all. Something totally new. And in Peter, he found the perfect, as it were, performer. I first met Peter Sellers at the bar of the Hackney Empire in about 1948. Uh, I had gone to the Hackney Empire with some of my conference to see Harry Seacombe appearing on the stage. Uh, and uh, I was introduced to Peter Sellers by Michael Benteen, who also happened to be there. Peter was dressed in a, a, a one of these detect American detective Macintoshes with a trilby hat and gloves. He's, he was a bit overdressed. Looked like a, oh, I'd say like a funeral director. <laughs> of the world where he was dressed. Very quiet, very civil, and very laid back. We had, on that occasion, somehow, it, we started to arrange to meet each other. And gradually, piece by piece, this chemistry of Seacombe, Benteen and Sellers and myself, suddenly we were, I didn't like a magnet, drawn towards each other. Unexplainably so, but we only told lunatic jokes all the time. Everything was lunatic. It was not like any other jokes you'd hear. And somehow or other, a centrifugal force started to work on us. I got sucked in as the writer and I started to write these insane shows. The influence of The Goon Show, I think, never left Peter, ever. Every so often, he would do manic things which always astonished. I mean, I, I, to this day, I think, that his um, great performances that he gave in the two pictures he did with Stanley Kubrick, if you examine them carefully, they have a great sort of Goon Show manic quality which, of course, set Peter apart. A sort of certain madness, a kind of uh, comic madness, of, and sort of even sort of very black sometimes, which came through, which made it very interesting. It wasn't just a little lightweight job. It was much more than... The boiler house of his talent was the characters based in the Goon Show. That was the boiler house for him. All the energy stemmed from that. He relied a great deal on Spike in, in our period. Spike was the creative force. Peter was the performer. Um, I think Peter envied, in the best sense, uh, uh, Spike's ability to create. Peter was a wonderful adapter of other people's ideas. Um, he honed them and made them into something infinitely better than they could have been. But, he, but in terms of raw creation, Certainly, uh, Spike w was was the creator of almost all the ideas that, that came up. He lived in a house with his mother and father, and I used to sleep on the floor on a mattress, which actually was a rubber one, which by the dawn had deflated, so I was sleeping on the boards by the time morning came. I noticed this uh, tremendous affiliation between his, he and his mother. He would call out from his bed, Peg, Peg. And Peg would come in and say, what is it, darling? She'd say, can I have some breakfast, Peg? Sort of strange whining. I think he was in thrall to her all his life. Well, I suppose she was a kind of um, Arnold Wesker prototype uh, Jewish mother, you know chicken soup and barley every meal and uh, they used to have terrible rows. I remember when Peter left the house she would say I love you my darling boy and he'd say I love you Peg and she'd say but I really love you my darling and he'd say yes I know you love me Peg um, I love you too um, and this would develop until the end he, they were shouting at each other. I think Peter Sellers' father was dead and nobody had the courage to tell him. He was like a ghost in the background. He'd occasionally, he used to be seen smoking a cigarette 
and sometimes he'd play a few tunes on the piano. Very accomplished, you know, smoking and playing the piano at one and the same time. Family was full of... The thing I think about most, or I'm most vividly aware about with Peter Sellers, is his non-deviation from the character and his absolute and justifiable trust in that fact. He would get into a character very well and he would hang on to it. Uh, there's a program called Heavens Above, in which he plays a broomy. There you go. And uh, the, 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 the character is maintained perfectly from beginning to end. There's never one moment in doubt when you lose faith in that character. One level of his comedy is that Keatonish type of thing, that the face never changes, irrespective of uh, how bad the situation is, how frightening the situation. You would never get any faultyisms, for example. I mean, like John Cleese sort of imploding with fury and the teeth enamel sort of splintering like glass with this sort of churnable meltdown of frustration. What you get with uh, Sellers is this ostensible exterior sort of stoical face like this, you know, rather like Alec, Alec Guinness. One time, Peter was kind enough when he went to New York for the first time, he called my mother, who, who was then still alive and, and living in America, um, and when he came back, he said, I called your mother, and then he did both sides of the conversation, and he was uncannily like my mother. I mean, he's just, he just was an, an astonishing mimic. Mimicry is perhaps too small a word for what he could do. But this wonderful gift of, of being a person of a particular kind, particularly with a particular accent, I don't think he had any rival. Sellers was a Pro protean performer. He produced a variety, created a variety of uh, characters, uh, nearly all of them having no points of similarity one to another. The voice was the, the arrowhead of, of, of his performance. He hung on to that right from beginning to end. And, uh, of course, otherwise he'd... F when he did Fred Kite in, in, in I'm All Right, Jack, this was the first acting role he did. Um, other movies, like, let's say, The Mouse That Roared and, and, and some of those, were, were much more, more in his goon mode, much more in the comedian mode. And he said, and I think that I, his part in I'm All Right, Jack, and the Boating Brothers between them, lifted him from being a comedian into being an actor. When he was given it, he read it. And said he, he, he didn't want to do it. Uh, so we asked him, why? Why, why, Peter? He said, well, where are the laughs? Where does one get a laugh? And then we had to to explain to him as best we could that um, we didn't regard him as a goon for this film, that he was going to be playing a real character. And uh, there were laughs aplenty if he played it. Sometimes comedians, uh, when they move more into the, the straight drama field, uh, when it comes to making people laugh, as indeed there were lots of laughs in I'm All Right, Jack, I think they feel possibly, they're inclined to feel that they know best. They know better than the director when it comes to getting a laugh. Um, and that is not always the case. And I think in this instance, Peter realized what help and assistance that John could give to him. John won Peter's confidence, in my view. Once he got into the wardrobe, once he had put on that little Hitler moustache that Fred Kite and I'm all right, Jack, wears all the time. And then, above all, because as the cameras were about to turn, so the door of the studio stage at Shepparton opened, and in walked the Works Committee. Now, the Works Committee uh, comprised a number of, from Natke, from, well, from all the unions, but uh, carpenters, electricians, uh, camera, so on. And they stood, because I, I had just put up the bell, and they stood there silent. But when he started to play the scene as Fred Kite, the shop steward, they immediately recognized the man. They didn't see it as themselves. 
But they did the inexcusable thing in the studios when the camera is turning, they burst into laughter, which they couldn't contain. Uh, immediately, it was cut. And then I saw the change in Peter's face. He hadn't thought it was funny himself. But now he knew it was funny. And from that moment, he was... In particular, it was based upon uh, the um, ETU, the Ele Electrician's Trades Union, uh, shop steward at Denham Studios, uh, who one had known very well. Um, uh, and he was a very... Uh, he was a funny little man. Uh, un unintentionally funny, but he was funny. And very pretentious and very pompous. Um, and uh, we, we, we felt that he was deserving uh, in the cinema of those days when you didn't discuss trade unions at all. You could say what a bastard the boss was, uh, but you couldn't criticise the trade union. Strike all come out. He actually was heavily pressurised, I think, by the Boltings through the writing to become this character who was, because the Boltings were violently against trade unions. And they used this as their spearhead of attack. Peter Sellers representing somebody that they hated. Yet nevertheless, making a very great film for them. There's a monopoly of a mixture of emotions there, isn't there? I think he absolutely became Fred Kite, absolutely. I mean, the whole face, the whole character, the whole makeup, really, it was Hitler. Uh, it was Charlie Chaplin. Uh, it was them both rolled into, into one with a little tash. And you could, you could feel uh, Peter growing into this part. You could feel him almost uh, living it and talking it and breathing it. One of those same people, I'm sure must have been, Kite must have been based on, once said to my brother, whose name was Leslie, he said to him, Les, I'll tell you what the trouble is with this business. There ain't no intergity left. It's all compromise, compromise, compromise. Those are the actual words. And so Kite's words that way were reasonably genuine. Fred Kite is a great creation, rather than just another very good creation, because all the time Sellers' eyes tell you that he is deeply unsure of himself and knows that he's an absurd figure, deep down. Seekham apparently read a book on South America. And there's a, a South American monkey called a maquit, who, when it's attacked, shits in its hand and throws it at the opposition. So whenever Seekham <laughs> sellers is to meet, one will go, <laughs> And then the other one we go. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, it's a bit rude, but that sort of sort of madness, yes. In '58, he had bought a 16 millimeter Pyard Bolex camera, which uh, which which was the latest toy, and uh, wanted a chance to to play with it. And out of that playing um, became the running, jumping, and standing still film. Well, most of the jokes are mine in it. Uh, I wrote the jokes and I directed uh, uh, part of it. And then I had to go to Australia and I left the film with Peter and Peter gave it to Dick Lester to edit and he did something that I would never do, put music on in the background. What for? I don't know. Some tenor saxophone player playing away. Anyhow, it, did, it got accepted as being Dick Lester's film. Actually, it was mine. We I think used 11 minutes of film, maybe 11 and a half minutes of film, and the running time of the film in, in the end was 11 minutes. Um, it was really all we did was top and tail French beans and take, take the clever boards off the one end uh, and laid it together. And we edited it on Peter's drum kit with a little hand editing machine. And there was never any attempt uh, during the, sh the filming of it or during the post-production of it for it to be of any commercial use at all. It was really just a chance to play around with his camera. Um, and it began to grow until it reached the exorbitant cost of 70 pounds for the film. Trying to say to people, 
Look, you don't need ten million pounds to make a film. You can make one for as little as fifty. I thought somebody might take me up on that, say, wait a minute, if you can do that, here yeah, he's our man. But that never happened. No. This uh, exercise in, in what Peter's new camera could do suddenly became a serious piece of filming and it, and it started being shown in cinemas and it opened in, in a news theater near Piccadilly as Peter Sellers' Running, Jumping and Standing Still film. And then when I had made Hard Day's Night, which was showing at the London Pavilion across from it, they changed it. It came back again and it became Richard Lester's Running, Jumping and Standing Still film. And then Spike made a huge success with Son of Oblomov or something in the, in the theater that was down on Shaftesbury Avenue. And it became Spike Milligan's Running, Jumping and Standing Still. Richard Sellers was so um, inventive himself. He probably couldn't understand that a director couldn't keep up with his mind. That's the thing, that his mind went at such a rate when he was inventing characters that a director had to be talked into it. The two-way stretch was so easy because it was kind of, it was almost like playing at doing films because I had so little responsibility and um, I got on so very well with him and um, I used to say, do you think it would be funny if I did so-and-so or if I try?" And he would say, oh, yes, yes, that's, try that, try that, you know, all full of experimental things. He used to give me rather dirty lines to say because I always looked as if I didn't know what they meant, <laughs> which is something I've gone through my life with, really, with all the things I've done, like killing a sister or Sloan. I've always looked as if... I didn't quite know what I was saying, which of course I knew but In the car, <laughs> yeah. Lionel Jeffries, who was on the picture, he, uh, Sellers complained he rehearsed too long, and Jeffries complained that Sellers wanted to rehearse too short, and then Sellers wanted scenes changed, for not very good reasons, and then uh, I think I was in charge that week, Frank and I alternated, and I said, no, it's not to be changed, it's as script, and that's that. He didn't like it at all. He, he was down in Cardiff on location, uh, making only two can play for Sidney Gilead. And he had as his wife in the film uh, a young actress called Virginia Maskell. And her talent had already been noted by the critics, and I think she had a very, very promising future. Well, for whatever reason, and I have my own suspicion as to what the reason was, um, Peter Sellers took a ginha. Peter rang me up at the hotel and simply said, that girl is no good, she must go. She must go at once and you must cast somebody else. Just like that. Um, I said I won't do anything of the kind. Uh, why not? So. I said, well, you've got to be fair to the girl to begin with. She's only played one scene, and that consisted of taking a milk bottle out in the evening and the morning paper, and then she opened the front door and went in again. And there's no problem with that, and no proof. But we'll see when she plays the scene. No, she's no good. I've rehearsed with her. I know she's no good. He phoned uh, John and myself and said, look, this girl is worse than useless. Just worse than useless, she will ruin the film. Now, please, will you get on to Sidney Gilliatt and uh, uh, tell him. Uh, tell him that he must recast another actress immediately. Well, ap <laughs> apart from the fact that we would never think for a moment uh, of making such a suggestion to so senior and so skilled, a director as uh, Sidney Gilliard. Uh, it just happens that I personally had worked with Maskell uh, on another film, and I knew that she was extremely talented. So we had to very gently tell Pete, Peter that uh, he should get on with his acting and leave the judgment of performance to his director, Sidney Gilliard. 
And in point of fact, rather ironically, at the end of the picture, she was nominated by the, I think it was then the British Film Academy, she was nominated for the Best Actress, and Peter wasn't. Peter certainly had a great deal of insecurity. That's why he was always telling these funny jokes and funny stories and everybody would laugh. He would feel a little bit better. But deep behind, he would, I, I, you sense a very insecure man and a very frightened man who felt very small and unloved and ugly and all that kind of thing. And then with all this success he had, you would, it's very difficult to understand that for a public, that this was a very insecure man. What happens now? I know what. What? You pick these up. What do I want to do that for? Well, if anybody does, I mean, you can paint as much as you like. It look odd, isn't it? Picking bags like Anything is going to look a bit odd. Yes. All right. It's better than nothing. Uh, speaking as a director, you can't direct uh, people like Peter, you know, like, 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 like that. You can suggest, you can say something's funny, you can say a move is funny, or you can say, let's shoot this in wide shot. I mean, personally, I think Sellers was one of the most graceful, graceful of movers. He was a wonderful improviser, and I have often re regretted we never kept the outtakes on the scene where he runs away from the party and pretends to be the plumber in the kitchen with... John. There came the time, and we knew it would come, uh, when uh, an offer was made and Sellers appeared on the threshold and said, look, I have had this offer, and uh, it was a very flattering one and very beneficial in financial terms. He said, will you let me do it? Will you release me from the contract and let me do it? And John pressed the button of his intercom and said, will you send on uh, the copy of the contract uh, between ourselves and sellers, please, right away. Came down, he said, Peter, your contract? And he tore it up. He said, never feel that you're tied. And that is uh, what followed. Peter went to Hollywood and was spoiled rotten. When he first got the first panther, he rang me up like a child. And he said, I've got five weeks in Rome, he said, on a film called The Pink Panther, he said, with a bloke called Blake Edwards. And I'm getting 80,000 pounds. And over the telephone, we didn't have calculators in those days, I'm saying, well, hang on a minute, we've got pencils out. He's end of the line and I'm doing my end. And I said, well, if you do a six-day week, which normally you do on location, you'll be earning £2,666 a day. And he went, way, he said. He was thrilled. He was like a schoolboy. He was a boy, you know. You must always remember this about Peter. He was a marvellous boy a lot of the time of his life. Peter had that sort of ostrich syndrome that once he could as it were, totally obliterate his own persona, he felt much happier. Um, and that's why I don't think, you know, when he changed direction halfway through his career and decided he wanted to be a romantic lead, it didn't work. Uh, that stemmed, I was there at the time, that stemmed from a moment when he opened the paper and it said Mastriani, Peter Sellers, with sex appeal. And that plunged him into a deep, uh, sorrow and angst, and uh, he immediately went on a crash diet, and I think changed his whole personality. By he, he really, he was a fat boy struggling to get out. He was Mendoza, uh, you know, the family name. And um, I think when he tried to be a romantic lead, it didn't really work. It did something very subtly to his whole personality. One thing about being sexy is that it's like a rock star. It means that you have taken away a sense of irony about yourself and a sense of the ridiculous. And if you wish to keep, it was like he would only now go so far in being ridiculous that the chap who's still rather groovy and rather sexy can get into a few mixes, but he must remain sexy. And I think his reluctance to eschew or drop 
the sort of the sexy offstage, the Peter Sellers arriving at airports with Britt Eklund, Peter Sellers of the 60s, made his work suffer. I think people encouraged him to change from being uh, an easygoing character comic into a leading man, and that produced a kind of responsibility on Peter, which was, which was hard on him. I think it was Hollywood that really did indulge him to such an extent that when he came back uh, to, uh, to, into our fold, I mean, I was amazed. Uh, I mean, he, he had always been a very tense, uh, uncertain man. But now he, he, he was really difficult. He was very hard to deal with. When I met him, he was living in a semi-detached house with two kids and two dogs and, and a very ordinary uh, suburban lifestyle. He was overweight and jolly. And I think he started to produce a new image for himself, whether someone suggested it, whether he had decided that he had something different within him. Um, once he was on the yogurt, <laughs> things began to alter. I used to call him golden bollocks, you know, in the early days. I stopped it later on when he got rather ill. But in the early days, I mean, he was phenomenal. Whereas you and I would do something which would be total end to our career. If I'd done what Peter did half the time, I'd never have worked again. But Peter managed to do things, and for some extraordinary reason, he always fell on his feet, you see. I mean, he had, he had terrible enemies. I mean, he made enemies every day of his life. Dreadful enemies, powerful people. But he never gave a bugger. As Peter became more and more successful, I suspect that people ex expected him to be more of a unique creator of ideas than Peter was capable of being. When he became the major superstar, the man above the title, who was looked upon to take a piece of material that he'd agreed to make and turn it into something extraordinary, perhaps there was a tension there that Peter never felt, I am a great comic writer, uh, and they're expecting me to be this, to, to get them out of trouble. Uh, that may be a cause of some friction in the later period. And working with Peter could be quite quite an experience. On Casino Royale, we had a terrible physical set too in a caravan uh, just next to the next to the the set. It was Peter's quick change caravan, and we were having a, a discussion as to what was happening in the scene. And I wasn't at all in agreement with what Peter was doing, and he wasn't at all in agreement about what I, how I felt about the scene. And he, he lost his temper completely and threw a punch at me, which, uh, it was like schoolboys, you know, he threw this punch at me, which slid off my cheek and didn't quite make contact. So thinking, I've got to do something here, I threw a punch at him. And uh, I was told later from continuity and, and cameramen and people outside that they were watching this caravan <laughs> tilting backwards and forwards and, and hearing thumps and, and cries coming from it. All I remember is that halfway through a sort of uh, bear hug and pushing each other and falling against walls in this caravan, that the door opened and uh, Peter's stunt double came in and he grabbed us and separated us and he looked at us both and he said, I don't know which one to hit, I love you both. And Peter said, and I love you, Josie. So I said, and I love you, Pepsi. And we all hugged each other and went back to work. <laughs> Well, I, I knew a long time, a long time ago, by his mode of life, that he come from a family of all got heart problems. His father, his mother, his uncle, and he was very lazy. He didn't like doing anything active, physically active. You know, and he used to make me go downstairs and look spiky. Take, go downstairs and and turn my car lights off with you. And I used to say yes because I used to look up to him quite a bit. You know. And he'd tell me to go out and get so-and-so, buy him some cigarettes uh, and things like that. And he even bought shoes without laces in, so he would have to bend down and tie them up. He lived with a sort of Damocles over him, which people don't, many people forget. 
However difficult he got later on in life, and God knows he did get difficult, I always used to think to myself, yes, but you see, whereas you and I, we get a little bit of indigestion, we think, oh, well, you know, it'll go away or take a bit of something. Peter thought, well, this is going to be it again, because once he, that terrible thing happened to him in 1961, you put a memory he died twice, and he had seven heart attacks, and they brought him back twice, and all, we all know that. From that moment onwards, I think he kept thinking, well, it's going to happen any minute now. And maybe a fury built up in him, who knows? A rage thinking, why? Why should it happen to me? You don't know. He died. I mean, he said it was the most extraordinary thing. I mean, he couldn't remember, really. I think it wasn't as if he suddenly saw the River Jordan or anything like that. But he said, you know, he was quite open about it. If Rex Kenimer, the doctor, hadn't saved him, I mean, he was clinically dead. From that moment on, of course, he did uh, ride bicycles and diet and keep, try to keep himself fit. So I think it was a, a thing that was constantly in his mind. Any time we filmed with Peter, he had a bicycle around and between takes and, and at lunch would cycle around. He seemed to become more remote as he got older and more distant. And he loved long for the old days. Always longs like when the last time we were meeting, he said, I'm going to fly over and we're going to have a reunion spike from his flight from Paris with uh, Harry Seacombe and Michael Benteen. And fortunately, in fact, I'd said to you, time's getting on. Otherwise, one of us is going to walk behind the other box. And he flew over and had his heart attack, you know. Anything to avoid paying for the dinner. Peter used to consult um, a fortune teller a lot. Oh, Morris Woodruff, yes. Yes, Peter introduced me to Morris Woodruff because for a period, it was another one of his little fantasy sort of enthusiasms and he would live, die and breathe by Morris Woodruff. Wouldn't take a foot outside the house for a period unless he'd spoken to Morris. He uh, lived with the planchette board and the the star signs and the, uh, the zodiac and the fortune tellers, oh, they came out of the hills, they descended on him, you know. And I, maybe that's all part of it, he was a very superstitious man, very superstitious. Certain colours couldn't bear to look at them. I mean, it could be, it could be an electrician, it could be a continuity a continuity woman. There are stories, which I can't vouch for, there, is, there are stories where Peter fired continuity people because they were wearing purple. Peter arrived on the set and said, uh, what are you trying to do to me? So the producer said, uh, what do you mean? He said, are you trying to destroy me? What's wrong, Peter? He said, the train. So the man said, well, what's wrong with the train? He said, it's green, repainted. I mean, by then it had become a sort of a bit of madness, I think. A moment, please, Mr. President. I think Peter Sellers was a natural film actor. It was the natural medium for him because I, he is a minimalist as well, I think. I mean, if he either does absolutely nothing with his face or he does extremely... <laughs> I'm going to give you this pucker sort of RAF type, terribly authentic. I'm going to give you this extraordinary creation, Doctor Strangelove, which once again really sells itself by the authenticity of its madness. It isn't just sort of generalised, camped up, balmy acting. You really believe that this man is deeply and profoundly... The president in Doctor Strangelove, the third character of this amazing trio that he creates, looks forward, I think, to some of his most colour colourless figures, including his last great role in being there. And... I think that, like Olivia, he was tantalised by utter ordinariness, or the challenge of portraying utter ordinariness. Sellers uh, says, right, let's, let's look at the extraordinariness of ordinariness. He messed that up in A Girl in My Soup. What you actually get is vacuousness. There is a sort of emptiness there. And Olivia made the same mistake when he did this play about this Leicestershire businessman 
uh, it's called semi-detached. He was also trying to portray, taking on the challenge of supreme ordinariness. And he couldn't, in the same way that Sellers couldn't, make them interesting. I think this is the problem with the superstardom that came later, is that, that you, you don't get the chance to have a full range of people to draw upon, because if you're in limousines all the time, you don't meet many people. You meet show, other show business personalities, and, and those are not the people you draw on. It's when you're taking the bus and when you're walking down the street and nobody minds uh, that you, you develop this, this massive encyclopedia that you can call upon. Driving back uh, from filming one day with Peter, and he, he was dropping me off, actually, and uh, we pulled up and we were having a, a discussion about the day's work, and I didn't agree with something that he had done, and he was totally against what I had suggested, and I said, I'm terribly sorry, Peter, but there is no way that, that, that I think that will work. There's no way that that works. We're going to have to do it all again, and, and I, I, I mean, I respect you, but seriously, Peter, I just don't think it worked. And he thought for a moment, and he switched his car radio on, and there was some music playing. He said, tell me that, what did you say? And I said, there's no way that that last sequence we've shot is going to work. He said, but it does sound better with music. He was genuinely dissatisfied with most of his directors and he didn't have a very good name. But that was the torch, I think, the work. Uh, he wanted to do this flight of fancy comedy. If only it had been a director who could have done that with him, give flights of fancy with one, what you could, and possibly he could have done it today with modern technology going on. You know, he could have done do anything. He invented these amazing things. Uh, he invented somebody called Frieda Clench, an underwater soprano, has own tank, and put, put ads in, you know, the stage magazine. He also invented somebody else. You know, they used to say comedians fills the stage with flags or fills the stage with laughter. Peter took an ad in, which we both concocted, which was Thud, the baby elephant, fills the stage with filth. I think he was a, a sort of floating person. I don't think he had any definite ideas about himself. And I don't think he ever knew. He never appreciated that he had a great talent. He never appreciated that he was a great actor or a great entertainer. He never appreciated any of those things because he didn't know. And he certainly didn't know where he was going or quite who he was. We got dressed up as uh, rags, old soldiers. And with me playing trumpet, uh, Peter playing the drums, and Seacom singing, we went the length and breadth of the Strand and Oxford Street, and we collected something like about 35 pounds and not quite recognised. And when it was over, Peter said, you know, I've never felt so safe in my life as when I was walking as a tramp. And he said, I felt as that where I, that's where I belong, in the gutter, playing a trump. One Sunday, he was in one of his nostalgia moods, and he came to the, the house, and Audrey and I, and he went out the car together. And, uh, he was, you know, he was in between marriages, driving about, reliving the past, a bit sad really. Suddenly he pulled up outside one of his houses, chatting away about it, and then suddenly I heard this noise. And I looked round and he, he'd sort of fallen over the steering wheel. And his shoulders were heaving. Very peculiar. And suddenly this voice said, oh Christ, he said, whatever happened to L.A.C. Sellers? Yes, I am. You know, he was very sad. He was hiding. He was hiding his true colours, even sometimes to himself. I believe, I believe. He said to me, uh, the work is the most important thing for me, Joe, and I don't know, but maybe it is for you, but I feel that when we're working, and when I'm working, 
it stops me being aware that I'm alive. I don't think about anything else. And it's only when I stop working and we stop shooting that I'm aware again that I'm alive. Well, Peter, I would say, was um, an artist of spasmodic genius who was always looking for the bluebird of happiness and never quite found it. I think the way his life was shaping and uh, the degree of unhappiness that seemed to be bouncing around him, I think on the strength of it that it's hard to say this, but that he died at the right time. And the truth is that Sellers knew exactly who he was, that he had recognized what he was, and he really didn't like what he saw. Nevertheless, I mean, one has to say that Peter Sellers, the actor, brought laughter and happiness to millions and millions of people across the face of the globe. Now, if an actor wanted an epitaph, could he really ask for anything better? What is the image that comes into your mind when somebody says Peter Sellers? Something I can't tell you. Cut. There's goon-inspired lunacy when a rare and much-prized treasure is stolen in the case of the Muckanese battle horn. But next on four, goon show humour meets with silent comedy zaniness in the running, jumping and standing still film.